Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Well, thanks first, Calvin, and thank everybody uh, for being here and also for letting me be here in this uh, beautiful location here in Melbourne. Really happy for the invite. Um, Calvin already introduced it. I will be presenting recent work of me and uh, my co-authors on scaling up green hydrogen supply specifically. Uh, this is work of uh, me, then there's also Volker Uckert, um, also at PIC at the Potsdam Institute. Greg Nemet is a, a co-author from the US, from uh, Uni Wisconsin-Madison. Michael Jensteller is from Adelphi Research in Berlin, and then Gunnar Ludler also from PIC. Um, just Briefly, what I want to cover today. So I want to uh, first go in the uh, intro part a bit into well, why hydrogen and sort of like introducing our research question, what we specifically looked at. I'll give a short teaser on um, uh, showing, uh, showcasing the IEA hydrogen projects database, which is an important resource for us. And then also, also looking at EU 2030 targets for hydrogen, which are very ambitious, as you will see. Then um, briefly, with a nice little sketch, I'll go into uh, our model, which was a technology diffusion model, uh, where we did an uncertainty, where we added an uncertainty analysis to. And then I'll uh, show you uh, our results, uh, which are based on two different scenarios. The one being where hydrogen or green hydrogen um, grows similarly like solar and wind, specifically electrolyzers do. And the second one, a really an emergency deployment scenario, really to, to look at what would be possible under very different circumstances. In the end, I'll try to draw some broad policy uh, conclusions and outline some implications as well. Um, just uh, to let you know, this uh, what I'm presenting here today has already been um, been published in Nature Energy around uh, two months ago. Um, uh, so all what I'm talking about, you can also find in there. However, um, what I'm showing you here today, all the figures are with new data. The IEA releases its hydrogen project database once a year, and the most recent version was just uh, published, I think, just a couple of weeks ago. So we've rerun all the analysis. And uh, yeah, I'm showing you here some of the new figures, which are, however, quite robust. So you might not even be able to tell the difference, uh, which is good from a methodological viewpoint, we think. OK, um, so why hydrogen? So um, as you know, and that's also been acknowledged by the AA now, um, hydrogen is a key option to realize uh, the net zero greenhouse gas commitments, uh, which have now been put in place in various jurisdictions and countries around the world. And it's usually treated as um, especially valuable in replacing fuels in those applications that are hard to abate. Uh, they're often called hard to abate, which uh, often means hard to electrify applications. And that's also, if you look at a very simple sketch of the hydrogen value chain. That's also where a lot of the research and attention has focused on. So essentially looking on the very right hand side here on the demand side, really asking questions like, well, if we have the hydrogen uh, at some point, where do we use it? Where do we put it? And um, a lot of uh, interest at task uh, yeah, went in that. For example, there's the famous hydrogen letter by Michael Liebreich and also other research that really deals with, well, where do we put the hydrogen once we have it? Um, Especially, um, that might be more of a, a European thing, um, especially regarding infrastructure. There's been a lot of discussion and also many, uh, many studies on how do we transport it? So sort of like the, the link in between the supply and demand hand side. Um, how do we transport it? And then specifically for Germany, where I'm from, um, how do we import it? Because Germany wants to import loads of uh, hydrogen from uh, other countries that have better renewable potential. So many studies also looked at, well, um, how do we do that? What different carriers are there? How much, was it, how much will it cost? When will it be available? All kinds of that. And um, not quite as much attention, I have the feeling, I would argue, has been put on the supply side. I mean, there has been research, um, well, a lot on life cycle emissions. So basically asking, how do we produce it? Do we go for green hydrogen, which is um, uh, produced via uh, electrolysis using renewable electricity? Or do we go for blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen, which is uh, natural gas based? And then also like specifically here, how much will it cost? So that's just like to outline what, um, yeah, sort of like the, the research agenda that is out there. Now we sort of now ask a bit of a different question in view of the really urgent uh, climate mitigation um, goals that we do have, especially um, over in Europe, I mean, uh, gradually also in other places around the world. I mean, last week on Friday, um, Wolf Peter Schill had a talk here on all the different um, uh, goals that uh, Germany is trying to achieve with its uh, energy, even with the energy transition. So we sort of ask, well, how long will all this take? How long will it take until we can actually have some of that green hydrogen available? And will it be in time for climate mitigation? 
And what we do look at, so we look at an indicator that is definitely on the supply side. So we look at electrolysis capacity for green hydrogen production. But we also see that a bit as a proxy for the entire value chain. So really as a proxy also for the systemic challenges of ramping up supply, infrastructure, and demand simultaneously, which is really something completely new with hydrogen that we're trying to um, yeah, get a new, uh, uh, establish a new energy carrier, essentially. So yeah, looking at electrolysis capacity, uh, let me show you what it looks like today and also in the future and some data points. So this is the IEA hydrogen project database uh, version 2022. And what we can see here is projects in the EU now listed by country. It's quite diverse. In the past, usually Germany has quite had quite a big share. The future um, up until 2030 is what you can see here in the small part in the right hand side. A lot of that will shift to uh, more to southern Europe, to Spain specifically. So generally what we see is, well, there is a huge project pipeline. It looks encouraging, right? And um, that is true. Um, however, there is a bit of a catch to this until you look at um, actually what the project development status of all these projects is. And uh, if you do that, and that's sort of like the, the blue and the red bar here, that is projects that are listed either in the feasibility study stage, which, uh, and we talked to the IA about it, is a really broad category. So meaning the feasibility study might already be underway or it might just be planned. So really a broad spectrum in there. And then even uh, more uncertain projects uh, that are here in red. So in the concept study stage. So essentially what we're seeing is that even projects that, are, uh, that have been announced to come online in just two years time. So just by the, so just in 2024, more than 80% of those don't have a, an FID. So a final investment decision in place yet. So it's really a bit questionable how many of those will really materialize in the short term. Um, can look on the global level as well. This is now globally by region. So in red, you see EU, then the MENA region, Americas, Asia. There's also Australia in there. Now, again, if all those were realized, we could easily um, grow uh, capacity by a factor of more than 20 from 2021 to 2024. So quite staggering growth rates. But here again, same picture, really. So a lot of that. And also here, even uh, those projects announced to come online just in two years' time. Uh, are still uncertain. So we just don't know. I mean, the final investment decision has not been put in place yet. Um, since I'm talking here uh, in Melbourne, in Australia, um, Australia is here. Um, so uh, you can see that especially uh, later on, around 2030, uh, it actually has quite a solid chunk of the uh, project pipeline uh, already here. And um, we can look also at, well, what does the project pipeline look like um, by development status? And that's what you can see here in the lower right panel now, uh, where we can see, well, first of all, that there was practically zero um, um, electrolysis capacity right now. I actually looked it up. So according to the IEA data, it's eight megawatts in 2021. And I mean, the total project pipeline sums up to more than around 40 gigawatts, so like a factor 5,000 in 2030. However, the, it, it looks even a bit more discouraging here because if the, of all those projects, again, announced to come online in two years' time, more than 97% have not secured a final investment decision. So, I mean, if, if you uh, want really to have that running up and running in two years' time, now would probably be a good time to get the money flowing as well and to actually order the electrolyzer and get it installed. So without, with all that, so you can see there's a bit, uh, well, quite a bit of uncertainty in here. And so we asked ourselves, well, how, real, how do we make sense of all this? Like how reliable are all these really bold announcements and how, how trustworthy are they in the end? And just to give you an idea on uh, what we did in our study, um, let me briefly show you an example now just for the EU. So just focusing on the short-term outlook in the EU until 2024. So this is now same figures that you saw before, the same two panels. So on the left, um, all the announcements up to 24 in the EU by country and uh, in the middle then again, um, all the um, um, uh, same project pipeline by project development status. And again, big chunk of that is uh, still uncertain, um, which is um, a bit of a problem if we look at where we actually want to be. And that is the EU has recently um, upgraded its hydrogen target. It was previously 40 gigawatts. It's now being stated in quantity. So in, as 10 million tons uh, of domestically produced hydrogen in 2030, that's up there. Um, so that's uh, roughly equivalent to around 100 gigawatts of electrolysis capacity. Now, um, and if all that would be realized, uh, we'd be able to uh, get around 2 to 3% of final energy um, through hydrogen with that. 
However, now, um, let's not be so pessimistic all the time. Let's um, generously assume that maybe around 30% or so of those uncertain projects um, that we are seeing uh, just in two years' time will be realized in the end, so in two years' time, so just as a rough assumption for now. And even then we see, well, even if that, uh, even if we manage to do that, um, that we still need a growth rate of more, more than 90, almost 100%. So essentially really a doubling of capacity each year to uh, really attain that target in 2030. And that is substantially higher, as you can see. So that's around, uh, substantially higher than what we've uh, achieved in the past, which were like 22%. I mean, now you could argue, well, okay, but I mean, the momentum is just building up and policies uh, are just being put in place. However, it's also substantially higher than anything we've historically observed for uh, both solar PV and wind power. So the, the two biggest success stories of the energy transition, essentially. Um, so um, what we're seeing here is um, in their respective boom phases, how did PV and wind grow um, in various six year slices? So really there's no single six year period where it grew as quick as we would need to see for hydrogen. So it's really unprecedented growth that we need to see to achieve that target. And even then the uh, total volume that we can supply with it is uh, relatively modest still. So one thing that we can already say now is that definitely green hydrogen unfortunately cannot help or ha can hardly help in the current EU energy crisis. Now, um, what we did in our studies, essentially, we, we generalized this approach of doing this inter-technology comparison um, with hydrogen, and we generalized it once by taking broad distributions over growth rates, and then also by extending the scope, not just looking until 2030, but also much further until 2050. So, uh, yeah, until the time when uh, climate neutrality is supposed to be reached for the, uh, to attain the Paris Agreement. Just to give you an idea on, that's, Look, take a step back again and look at the global numbers, so really like the global challenges. Um, growth of energy technologies typically tends to follow those S-shaped curves, so those logistic sort of curves, where in the beginning you have exponential growth, however, um, it just takes time until that really kicks in, also in absolute terms. So during that growth phase, you really have exponential growth. Then like in the middle here, you would say, well, yeah, this is what's, called, what's being called the growth phase. That's sort of where growth slowly becomes a bit linear. And then towards the saturation phase, it actually flattens out again um, once you reach the final market volume then. Now, just to outline the challenges. So as I said, on the global level, last year, we were at around 600 megawatts or so globally of global capacity. And um, that's according to the IEA data again. And in 2050, where we need to be is uh, 3.6 to 5 terawatts for global climate neutrality. Now, it depends a bit on who you ask. So those 3.6 terawatts are as, uh, as IEA scenarios, five terawatts is from the IRENA. However, in any case, the scale up challenge is staggering. So electrolysis capacity needs to grow by a factor of 1,000, so 6,000, 8,000 in just 30 years. And that is also quite staggering compared to uh, how much renewable energy, so like solar, PV, wind, uh, hydropower, all that needs to grow, which is around tenfold in the same scenarios. So really a staggering uh, scale-up challenge. And we then asked ourselves, okay, so what would be plausible um, expansion pathways for green hydrogen? And uh, to analyze that, we did an uncertainty study and we varied different parameters in a uh, probabilistic way. I just want to show you which they are. So the first one, you can see that in this little, um, little inlet plot here, is what we termed the initial capacity. Now, why is that uncertain? I mean, we could just take last year's value, which we know for sure, but we do want to include a bit of that momentum that we, are, that we can see is building up uh, in the market already now. So we want to look a bit into the future, but then again, also not like really far into the future until those 2030 numbers, which are just in, like completely uncertain. So what we do, so in the paper actually, uh, because that was still data from a year before, we take 2023 as a starting year. However, uh, the numbers I'm showing you here now is with uh, year 2024, so what you've seen before, as the year when our model starts. And therefore, this is uncertain because, as I've shown to you previously, we don't know how much will really be in place by then. The second one, you can see this little triangle, whoops, sorry, this little triangle here, the blue one, that's the, the what's been called the emergence growth rate. Uh, why emergence? Because it's really only attained, so it's the exponential growth rate that is attained uh, when we are still far away from the maximum, when we're still far away from the saturation term. So really when that saturation has not really, uh, it's not really damping the overall uh, progress yet. And um, yeah, for that, uh, I show you later which different scenarios we distinguish. 
Now, typically what you have in these kind of models is then that you do have a, a fixed final market volume. So, so to say, if you have a new technology and it penetrates into a market that is already there, right? So you'd sort of have like a fixed final market volume, new technology comes in and just essentially sees the entire market volume already from the start and can just uh, go ahead and uh, yeah, um, take over that market um, if it can uh, cost-wise and so on. We would argue now, however, that this is not exactly the case for the hydrogen market because hydrogen market um, has been described previously by others. Yeah, Calvin's laughing. Yeah, I know that you can always like uh, get a bit of attention if, if you put in cute little, uh, cute little pictures. So it's uh, what's been described previously as a three-sided chicken and egg problem because I mean, we're looking at supply now, as I've shown to you previously on the like on that value chain. However, it's not just supply that you have to ramp up, but really infrastructure and demand simultaneously. And with hydrogen, it's really that those two don't practically don't exist yet. I mean, hydrogen is not used as an energy carrier or practically not at all uh, worldwide. So we really need to ramp up those three things uh, in, uh, in uh, a coordinated way. And that is different, for example, for solar PV. I mean, there you, you did have the infrastructure, the electricity grid was there. You did have the demand. I mean, people wanted to use power. So essentially, um, I don't mean to oversimplify the challenge, but I mean, all you needed to do was to plug in that PV panel. And this is different now for hydrogen because, well, you need to make agreements with who, who will buy it, how do, how do I get it there? And because of all these coordination challenges, we don't use this fixed final market volume, but instead make it like a, a linearly increasing uh, market volume, which we call then the demand pull, um, that we parameterize based on the policy targets. So for example, the of the EU in 2030, um, or by um, scenario results, if we have no, um, if they have no um, explicit policy targets in place. Now we also allow for a bit of anticipation. That's a free parameter in our model. We also have a, a sensitivity analysis uh, for that parameter. So essentially, asking, well, um, or giving uh, sort of like an, a parameter that tells you how much anticipation, so how much investors might anticipate demand to develop in the future. And in our default setting, we set that to five years. So what we do now is we vary these parameters to end up and to really cover like all the different worlds and all the uncertainty that we have. And then we run uh, like a, that as a kind of simulation model thousand and thousand times over again. I think overall, I think 10, uh, we have a um, yeah, sample size of 10,000. So we vary uh, the demand pool. We just take as an exogenous scenario based on policy targets and scenarios. The capacity, I mean, I've shown it to you, that comes from the IEA database. And now this is more interesting here now, growth rates. And we do distinguish different growth rates here. We look at one scenario, as I said, where it grows similarly to solar and wind. Um, so the two, like the growth champions of the energy transition so far, really. But even with that, you will see it's, um, yeah, uh, uh, green hydrogen will still remain relatively scarce. So we also look at what would really be possible under very, very special dedication in an emergency deployment scenario. However, let's first stick with the solar and wind comparison just to see, well, what did, what did we achieve in the past in the energy transition? And the two parameters and um, that you can see here now, that's for the uh, initial capacity, left is EU, right is globally. Now that horizontal bar that you can see here, that's uh, what you saw before for 2024, just fallen over, so to say, so just uh, flipped 90 degrees. And you can see that we take a very broad distribution um, of the initial capacity. So really spanning everything. So we assume that everything that uh, is under construction is actually also built on time. And then we do take a distribution that is again centered around, uh, that has an expected value of reaching 30% of the uncertain projects. Uh, yeah, so it goes uh, even uh, in the EU beyond uh, the project pipeline. For the growth rate, I mean, this is for the case of solar and wind, right? So, I mean, obviously, we have to take growth rates of solar and wind in there. And we do that by um, extracting wind and solar growth rates in their respective boom period. So, in their period when they grew the very fastest, um, which is something around 1995 to 2010, I think. And we want to get a bit of variation in there. So, we do it in a sliding window kind of approach and extract exponential growth rates and then just parameterize this. Uh, very broad growth rate distribution from it, which for the EU, yeah, we take a lower value at 15%, just uh, yeah, because we have to cut it off at some point. And uh, we don't constrain it uh, at the top. So for the EU, it even goes slightly above uh, 100%. Uh, globally, growth rates are a bit lower or were a bit lower of wind and solar. So sort of ending close to 75%. 
Now we throw all that into our model, um, as I said, 10,000 times, and then aggregate all those different um, expansion pathways to get to what we then call the, and that's also the title of our paper, this probabilistic feasibility space for green hydrogen supply. And that's what you see here now for, again, the case of wind and solar. So on the x-axis, you have time. Um, the lower panel is just zoomed into the, uh, up until 2030. And on the y-axis, you have uh, capacity. So now the shading sort of uh, now tells you how likely it is. So it's sort of like the normalized uh, probability density. So how likely is it that we get to a certain amount of electrolysis capacity at a certain point in time? Just to explain again briefly, those little circles here, those are the targets that we put in place. So you can see again for the EU 2030, that's those 100 gigawatts that I showed you earlier. Uh, Long-term 2050 is 500 gigawatts as mentioned in the EU hydrogen strategy. And um, from that, we parameterize uh, that dotted line that is our demand pool. So how quickly the market is, um, um, is expanding. And now what we see is essentially very little supply for around 15 years, uh, both compared to the policy targets, but also compared to the overall energy system or the long-term target where we want to be in the future. However, that being said, there is some kind of a breakthrough moment where sort of like that, sort of like the probability mass tips towards uh, the upper end and then more closely follows uh, the demand pool. However, when exactly that breakthrough will occur is very uncertain as this is just really the, the, um, the aggregation uh, of all these different scenarios that we calculated. Um, also, non-surprising to you, I mean, you've seen it before, the EU targets, so those 100 gigawatts uh, are unfortunately out of reach under growth rates like solar and wind, so they do require something more. And interestingly, we can also look at a, at a marginal distribution, so really sort of cut through this distribution mass here around uh, the breakthrough year, so here for 2030. Eight. And we see that that's not just a wide range, but despite our parameters following uh, a normal distribution with a clear with a clear maximum, we do get this interesting this bimodal distribution. So essentially, that means that uh, in 2040, from what we know today, so I mean, either you have already, so it's relatively likely that either you're still at very low capacities or that the breakthrough has already happened and you are already for, like quite far high up there. You can do the same globally. So uh, looking at the global probabilistic feasibility space. And what we see here is again, I mean, growth rates were a bit lower on the global level. So relatively little supply compared to, especially where we need to be in the long run. So in 2050, and that extends for well around 20 years or so, again, with a lot of uncertainty, but that short-term scarcity is relatively robust. There's also a breakthrough moment here on the global level, even a bit later, so more around 2045 or so. And also here uh, in 2045, we again see a extremely wide range. So basically, uh, under those growth rates that we've seen, basically anything from close to zero up to well, 3000 gigawatts would be possible under those growth rates. Um, just to highlight a bit um, what scenarios tell us where we should be in 2030, I've indicated uh, on the global level a few scenarios. So this is Irina here, this little, this little uh, thing that you can see here. So Irina says that we should be at 350 gigawatts in 2030 in their scenario. The IES says uh, 720 gigawatts, so up, up around here. And um, there are even some scenarios, for example, by Bloomberg NEF and a London-based uh, consultancy that also do a lot of hydrogen work. They say we should be at around 1.7 terawatts already in 2030. So um, all of those are obviously well off the chart here. So key message from all of this, really uh, under growth rates like solar and wind, and I always have to add this because it's really a conditional statement, short-term scarcity, long-term uncertainty of green hydrogen. Um, if all of this was a bit depressing, um, don't despair. We also looked at a different case. So we also looked at, well, what happens if acrylosis does grow faster than wind and solar? So let's just have a look at some very, very different technologies that we also analyzed. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe it's a bit small. I hope you can see it. So this is really now um, a wide portfolio of completely different technologies, just to get a sense of how quickly things uh, grew in the past. Uh, the, we were just looking for like the fastest growing technologies that we could find. And they go from things like World War II military aircraft and liberty ships in, uh, in the US over to nuclear weapons in both the US and the Soviet Union, nuclear power in France. But we also have like really highly modular IT kind of technologies, such as smartphones. We also have e-bikes or internet hosts, 
Um, there's also fracking gas here in the US, high-speed rail network in China, so really also centrally coordinated technologies, a wide portfolio of different, different technologies. And what we then do, we again extract uh, those growth rates. I mean, you can see that most of them like fit this S-shaped logistic curve relatively well. So that's also what we do. We fit uh, those logistic curves to it, extract the growth rates again. And from that, we get another distribution of those growth rates. So, right, so the numbers here now correspond. And um, if we then now plug that back into our model, all other assumptions being equal, uh, we end up at this, uh, what we coined the unconventional uh, feasibility space for um, green hydrogen supply. And what you can see here now is really that this is not really what's necessary to actually reach the repower EU target. So those 100 gigawatts are really so ambitious that you do need something uh, close to like a wartime or like a crash like deployment to achieve it. And also on the global level, we can see that uh, this is also really what's required to really close the gap between the uh, potential um, uh, demand and the feasible supply that we calculate. Just one last figure that I want to share with you because, um, because it might be a bit counterintuitive that this all takes so long. So let's just quickly look at the breakthrough year. So that is the year in which the growth, the, like deployment in absolute terms is highest. And again, you can see it on the left for the EU, right globally. Uh, the red thing here now is our conventional. So the wind and solar case and the blue, like before, the emergency deployment case that I just showed to you. And what we can see is that despite exponential growth, um, um, even under growth like, like solar and wind, it just takes a long time until we really get to really high absolute deployments levels per year. And only the emergency deployment can really accelerate that breakthrough substantially to, well, yeah, between 2030 and 35, maybe. So that's really what's required. We can then again also like take a bit of a uh, like uh, take like two intersections here 2030 and 2040 look at the distribution of capacity here. Uh, however, I'm mostly showing this to you because we have a secondary access now here and that's the final energy share and that's sort of one of our main statements also in the paper, how much uh, so in relation to the overall size of the energy system will we be able to power or to to fuel with uh, hydrogen over time. And we see that relatively clearly. So here, so even under the um, so even under the growth case like solar and wind, we have less than one percent of final energy by 2030 in the EU. And globally, it takes even longer. So it's very likely that if it grows similar to, to wind and solar, it takes uh, at least like another 10 to 15 years until we cross that one percent threshold of final energy. Just because we are starting from such a low level. Okay. Um, now. What does this all mean? What does this all mean for policymaking? So what do we need to do? So I want to share with you three uh, sort of policy implications or insights that we think uh, are, would be wise for policymakers. First one being obviously that market ramp up needs to start now, just because we have such low levels, it just takes time until, it, until we really get there. And because we already know today that we will need a lot of that green hydrogen, um, for uh, climate mitigation for various applications. It really, it's really important to start now. And that needs, as I said before, specific coordination. So really to break that cycle between uh, supply, infrastructure and demand. Also regulation, that would be, for example, that could be quotas, but also obviously just a lot of funding. So that could be um, subsidies in terms of CAPEX, so capital expenditure, operating expenditure. For example, if you have a steel plant and want to shift that to, or want to switch that over to direct reduction uh, using hydrogen, that could be, uh, or should be subsidized with tools like, for example, CCFDs. And I mean, there are some encouraging signs that we can see. So, I mean, the two largest economies in the world, the EU and the US, they have uh, implemented or about to implement new hydrogen policies in the EU. That's been done via the EU IPSI projects, uh, um, which stands for Important Projects of Common European Interest. And there's a, a stream for hydrogen projects there as well. There's also the EU Hydrogen Bank. Not sure how much the details have been worked out with us. In the US, there's the Inflation Reduction Act. So there is definitely moving coming in. However, I mean, from today on, it's still not really clear whether that will suffice or not, but it's still encouraging to see. And we would argue, as long as we don't really know yet about the future, it is sort of a balancing act because, of course, we need to support hydrogen for the applications uh, where we really need it. But simultaneously, we should not neglect alternatives. And those alternatives are especially direct electrification. So the market ramp up of green hydrogen should not slow down the market ramp up that we also need for, say, heat pumps, say, electric vehicles, 
or also electrification of industrial heat. So all of these, which are often also, or usually always more efficient in the end. So make better use of scarce electricity. And finally, a word on risk assessment. We believe there is a risk of overestimating hydrogen's potential simply because if uh, in the future we do find out that supply and prices uh, surpass expectations so that in 20 years time we do uh, all of a sudden get a lot of very abundant and cheap green hydrogen, it will be easy to extend the use case. So, I mean, we will find applications for that. No, no worries about that. However, in the, uh, in the opposite case, if we now think that in 20 or 30 years time we'll have loads of green hydrogen and it just doesn't and that just doesn't materialize so if supply falls short of those application expectations then it's just often too late to switch i mean if we have if we keep the uh, gas boiler in our basement now to heat our home uh, in the assumption that in uh, many years time we'll have green hydrogen to fuel it with and then that just doesn't come then it's just too late to switch that on a broad scale so, and, and then we are really in a fossil lock-in world. So really managing expectations here, I think, is important. So bottom line, sort of, yes, scale up now, but ideally don't just bet on it yet. So don't just bet on cheap and abundant green hydrogen. I started to say, don't, don't put all your eggs in the same basket. Don't, don't go full on green hydrogen and uh, forego all the alternatives. Um, just brief outlook. So, I mean, we do have ongoing discussions uh, going on just a week ago. I just want to share that with you. There was a uh, Jewel preview, it's called. It was actually more a review than a preview. But in the journal Jewel, um, a researcher from Norway um, shared some of her thoughts uh, and reviewed our paper um, a bit critically. Quite interesting. Also, if you're interested in the methodological parts, we also have a carbon brief guest post forthcoming. And I mean, we're considering different avenues for future research here. So, obviously, Hydrogen is not the only thing that needs to scale up quickly. There's also direct air capture, for example, or you could say generally CCS, CCU. Also, uh, e-fuels are um, obviously also a, a big candidate here, what we could look at. Also thinking about like integrating this somehow in IAM, so an integrated assessment models, which is sort of what our group mostly does in Potsdam. Um, I mean, already now we use these results to parameterize our model, but uh, yeah, we're also thinking about whether we can make this a bit more iterative, this exchange. And also then lastly, looking at some limiting factors, because I mean, as you've seen now, we haven't really like, we, we didn't go into the details on well, what is actually limiting the pace of that ramp up. And yeah, we could assess that as well. And uh, with that, I'll leave it for you for now and leave you with this uh, relatively bad pun and terrible meme. And uh, thank you again very much for being here. And I'll look forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. Okay, so for those of you who've raised your hands um, in here, in person or online, uh, I'll be inviting you for those online to unmute your audio and ask your questions live. And before asking a question, please introduce yourself with your name and affiliation. Okay. Uh, hi, Martin Kittler from uh, the German Institute for Economic Research. Thanks very much for this uh, fantastic presentation. Um, I, I was wondering, you, you showed that once this ramp up really accelerates, we end up with a probability with these two peaks yeah. and sort of like a saddle in between. And just following the median curve, it looked like we want to either be in the saddle or the more progressive peak and uh, yeah what what do you reckon what can we do in order to end up at this side and not at basically zero capacity yeah good question so yeah we're also actually surprised by that uh, i mean the the rational behind it is easy to understand once you look at how this s-shaped diffusion uh, i mean essentially like the curve lingers for a while at relatively low levels then it's sort of like an explosive growth i mean that's how exponential growth often works and then it takes a long time and lingers again quite like like for a long time again on the upper level so that's sort of where this comes from and i mean it's obviously uh yeah it's bad for for policy making and for for risk management because i mean today um as long as we don't really know i mean it's probably safe to really like somehow hedge against the risk that we end up down here and uh, still at the same time, as I said, I mean, that goes into the direction of, uh, yeah, how do we make sure that we that we end up there? I mean, it's really policy instruments. I mean, if, you, if you're interested also in, that's also part of what uh, Ida here uh, sort of criticized on our model a bit, that is that we don't really distinguish between uncertainty that comes from like techno-economic parameters so that we can't really influence 
And then uncertainty that is like a policy choice in the end. And, um, and that is an important distinguishment in the setting that we chose here, where we look at different technologies, we can't really, I mean, to really disentangle that and to tell policymakers, this is what you need to do to really end up here. We'd need to model like all kinds of other things. So like costs and uh, like learning and all these different things. For now, if we just do this sort of agnostic, I would call it uh, inter-technology comparison, um, it's just about, well, hedging against the risk, but simultaneously, and that's maybe a fair point of critique that I take also from this preview, um, communicate to policymakers, well, do something now still. Like, it's important that we uh, that we get up there. Yeah, sorry, that's all I can say with you because we didn't look into the policy instruments and we didn't quantify them for this study. Oh, yes, next, Peter. Yep, yep. Um, Peter Rayner, University of Melbourne. Um, you. I think probably went some way towards answering this question at the end of your last answer. How much competition is there between a really vigorous ramp up and, and all the policies we might make for acceleration of green hydrogen versus other technologies, other abatement strands? So um, if we if we push too hard on this, do we actually run the risk of crowding out other techniques because we need the same workforce, we need the same materials, we need the same infrastructure? Uh, all that kind of that that kind of thing. Yeah, interesting question. Well, I mean, we I mean, it would be very different infrastructure in the end, actually, between those different worlds. So between either a world with lots of often like lots of electricity, or say uh, the hypothetical future of lots of hydrogen. Um, I would argue, yes, there's definitely risk. I mean, there's only so much political capacity um, for climate mitigation in general. So it, make, it makes sense to really focus that political capacity. And that means in the end also funds for like subsidies and, uh, subsidies and all that to really focus that on obviously where it does the most good. So where like the abatement potential is highest. And typically, as I said, that's not the case for green hydrogen because they are usually more efficient alternatives. However, as I said, it's, it's sort of a balancing act because simultaneously we've seen how challenging it is just to get up to those numbers that the IEA and ARENA have been calling for, for example. And we do need them also for climate mitigation, right? So it's not a really like an either or, but it's really, we need both just in a, in a sort of good balance. And yes, I do think that there is a risk of crowding out other more efficient alternatives and therefore really really need to, to, uh, yeah, to be good in striking that balance between direct and indirect electrification. Thank you. Hi, sorry, I have another question. Um, I was just wondering, in the past two to three years or so, we've seen um, a phase where targets were massively increased because you know, all the global leaders finally understood, okay, we need to do something about it and fast. Um, and and now we see, okay, we might end up not being able to scale crucial technologies um, fast enough to to really manage the transition. Um, and of course, you, I mean, you said you you didn't really look at policy instruments and didn't really compare policy instruments that were put in place for, for example, renewables. But do do you do you have a feel for what what policy instruments might be most suitable to scale up as fast as possible yeah so um yeah so just i mean you you mentioned sort of those those two gaps i mean there's this ambition and the action gap and i think the the ambition gap is a bit closing i mean like the ambitions are so high now especially in the eu uh i mean the previous target was 40 gigawatts by 2030 and now it's well, i mean they're now transferred transferred it to to a uh quantity target of uh so of in megatons and so, I mean, they essentially uh, increase it by a factor of two to three. So, I mean, the ambition gap, I would say, is closing. But yes, the 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 uh, the action gap or whatever it's called, that is still very, very obvious and uh, yeah, hard to close. I think, I mean, the 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 instruments that the EU is putting. I mean, I can mostly speak like from the EU policy perspective. And I think the the instruments that they are putting in place uh, are probably they they probably do go into the right direction. Uh, for example, subsidizing like essentially like the entire supply, uh, supply chain. So really not just electrolyzers, but then also uh, really making sure that that hydrogen will be bought by somebody, for example, with uh, CCFDs, also getting global cooperation in place now. So that is, for example, with this H2 global scheme, which is sort of like a double action scheme where the state is sort of like the intermediary between uh, exporters and then Germany as an importer. So, I mean, these uh, things are taking shape now, but... Um, 
I mean, you've seen the challenges, and I mean, you know how uh, how much money, for example, also Germany spent on scaling up solar PV, and still what we could get with that. So, uh, I mean, there are, I would say, I, I would be cautiously optimistic, but still, it is it is a massive challenge, and there are there are good arguments both like in favor and against why it could go faster or slower, and yeah. I would say we like with this, we try to be relatively agnostic to that and just well um, highlight the challenges ahead so that people don't think, well, yeah, hydrogen is coming and all's good. Hi, uh, Evan Stammer to you from Carbon Risk Management. A fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering whether you did any scenario analysis whereby uh, you sort of looked into the drivers uh, that would switch us from this current sort of um, solar PV and wind trajectory into an emergency setting and what might be some of those triggers that caused us to switch over and wake up at a global coordinated um, scale. If it's out of scope, that's fine. No, well, I mean, it was, it, it was like we deliberately left that out of scope for this for this part. But I mean, I mean, it goes into the same direction. I mean, I often get asked like similar questions. I mean, Martin's question also went in a similar direction. Like, how do we? Well, like, what's the solution now? How do we? How do we get from here to there? And uh, I think there's no simple answer to it. I think it is really like getting all these, um, yeah, well, really getting all these different policy instruments that we have and really in a like in a logical sequence, um, really implementing those. But I just want to stress that for global climate mitigation, it's also just very, very important not to forgo the alternatives. And that is especially direct electrification. For instance, in Germany, for example, renewable electricity will be scarce for many, many years. And um, therefore it just makes sense to use it where we need it most and where it can do the most good, as I said. So really, um, yeah, really striking that balance between ramping up hydrogen, and I'm sorry, I can't really, I can't, I can't give you the the ultimate recipe for how we can get to those really explosive growth rates, and um, at the same time, not uh, neglecting other alternatives that are more efficient. Just yeah. a quick follow up. Um, the you mentioned feasibility was a very broad category. Um, I'm just wondering if you um, burrowed into that a little bit to try and break down whether there were projects which were technically feasible, but market feasibility was lacking and they were just waiting for a demand signal. Um, and whether, you know, if the demand signal turns on, then all those projects that are waiting in that feasibility holding pen will switch over to becoming invest investable final investment decision, green light, that sort of thing. So, yeah, um, not sure how much I can share with you, but we, we did talk to, I think, three different electrolysis, like uh, people who are building electrolysis projects, uh, two in Germany, one in the US, and um, it varied. So it's not like there's like one major challenge that all of them faced. So some said that it was actually, so I think that was in the US, they actually said it was actually hard to, to actually buy the actual electrolyzer. So really there would be a bottleneck in manufacturing capacity of electrolyzers. However, I've recently read research, for example, by BNEF, um, that sort of goes in the direction of arguing, well, that might not be the bottleneck uh, after all. So really, like making like uh, making these electrolyzers won't be the issue so much. In Germany, uh, to the people we talked, there was a lot of discussion about um, like all the bureaucratic uh, yeah stuff that is uh, in the way of really getting all the permits and so. And that was actually like we talked to an electrolyzer um, who like to a company who want to build electrolyzer right next to a big industrial facility. So the demand would be immediately there. And infrastructure is negligible. So you just build, you just built like a pipe in like a pipeline in between uh, for a couple of hundred meters. And even there, they seemed um, yeah, they seemed uh, it seemed challenging to really uh, get it in place. And so it's not it it didn't look to be really one single thing. However, I think what we can say now, and I was not so sure about that a year ago, is that manufacturing capacity is not so much the bottleneck. I think it's really the business case. And I mean that in the end also boils down to cost. It's just that it's not economically like feasible for many, uh, yeah, without policy to uh, produce green hydrogen as in comparison to gray hydrogen, for example. So as long as that's not the case, it won't take up by itself, but it will need policy to push it in. And yeah, so that's still, that's really the big thing. Okay, All right. wonderful. Um, any further questions? Okay, great. Um, so thank you once again, Adrian, for the presentation. Just be able to see how, where the level of ambition and what is required in the next decade and to see the sense of scale actually is very illuminating in be able to assess the market and 
what is viable given the hype that is all behind the hydrogen economy. Okay, um, so thank you once again. Thank you. And so we'll just close out. So for details of upcoming events, please visit the Melbourne Climate Futures Academy and Climate Energy College websites. And thank you once again, everyone for attending and uh, Adrian for your wonderful presentation.